everyone. Welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Wednesdays where we can sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the thing, things, fun things, happy things, scaly things we're going to talk about this week going yeah. on in the world of Linux. I'm Vin, that's Jill. Hopefully you're watching at home. Maybe you're listening after the fact in podcast format, but Jill, you're back. You're back in one piece. Steve yes. survived. Yes, he did. He worked very hard uh, setting up the Linux Chicks of Los Angeles booth. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we're talking about Scale 19X, which you got to take. That was basically an entire week-long adventure, wasn't it? Oh, it was, because I was picking up people from the airport and entertaining people, because a lot, a lot of uh, friends that came out were here for a week. So <laughs> it was a week-long uh, uh, fun adventure. And uh, yeah, so many awesome things. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed because so many... Awesome things happened at scale, and I can't possibly talk about it all right now. <laughs> so I don't know, man. You tell that to the show note intro. <laughs> I know. I put in a huge show note intro. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, one of the cool things is that my Linux Chicks LA booth won the Best Scale Spirit Award, and we actually win an award every scale, but this is, it's always special every year to get one. And I have it right here. <laughs> Yay! I, I like they they redesigned the award and it looks pretty. <laughs> I really like that. And I was honestly just really really busy going back and forth from from the Linux Chicks LA booth to the Destination Linux podcast booth, where I was in both places trying to be fifty fifty at both. And we live streamed the convention at the Destination Linux booth. And at the Linux Chicks LA booth, we gave away tons of swag and a laptop. And yeah, as I've been cleaning out my computer room, I, we uh, uh, had people spin the wheel of swag. It's a, a wheel you can spin. And depending on where it lands, you win an award. And uh, so we gave out at the Linux Chicks booth, we gave out penguins and penguin stickers and erasers. And then the good items were uh, actually mechanical keyboards, mice, and Bluetooth speakers and headphones. So it was uh, stuff that I had from cleaning out my uh, Jill's Computer Hardware Museum. <laughs> there was so much. And we raffled off a laptop, too. And uh, that was awesome because it went to a dear friend of ours who happens to work in education. So it worked out perfect. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And it was so awesome. I had uh, Strider's Lutris booth next to the Linux Chick-fil-A booth. Woohoo, finally. Did, we've... did Strider behave himself? Yes, he did. <laughs> but this was nice because in, at past scales, we were on uh, opposite sides of the expo hall. So that was really nice. And we were close to the OpenSUSE booth as well with Mir PPC and Drew and our, our favorite crew. And of course, Mir PPC is is here in chat, one of our patrons. And I had a wonderful dinner Friday night with my Destination Linux crew, including with uh, one of our patrons, Dos Geek. Ryan Dos Geek flew out for the event from Destination Linux, who I co-host with. And um, we got to for that dinner, we got to hang out with the System Seventy Six crew, including Emma and Cheese Bacon and Jax. And we got to hang out with Gardener Bryant, the Linux gamer. And that was a lot of fun. It was nice to finally meet him in IRL. It's a really nice guy, too. And you can check out his latest Scale 19X video because I was featured in it. <laughs> and actually, the uh, Jay, the Linux guys, Learn Linux TV. He's been featuring us a lot. <laughs> a lot of the crew... Uh, that was uh, a lot of the Linux Gamecast crew that was at uh, the Southern California Linux Expo. So, yeah, there's Cheese Bacon. Oh, he's such a nice guy. And it was so wonderful meeting him in IRL. He's such a gentle spirit. And I, lo I love him to death. And I like him even more now that I've met him in person. <laughs> and there's Emma. She is like my, she's my spirit unicorn animal. <laughs> I call we called each other and there's my Linux Chicks LA booth and that's me and Betty and Sharon and Nicole and we worked hard winning that award 
Ah, unfortunately, that picture Steve Husband isn't in, but <laughs> he was there to receive the award as well. And that is me with Monica Ann's Madden, who I uh, had met for the first time in IRL as well at scale. And she is one of our patrons in chat and the Ubuntu community representative at Canonical. And it was so wonderful also meeting her because I had met her on the Big Daddy Linux podcast years ago. So we've been good friends ever since. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm glad everybody had a good time. <laughs> yeah. I really am. Uh, yeah. Even though it was a smaller scale this year because yeah. of the, you know, the pandemic and and um, the surge in COVID, it was a bit smaller, like by a third, <laughs> but it was still a wonderful event. And it was just nice to be back with my scale family again. It really That's was. One of the things we were talking about in the pre-show and, you know, it kind of worked out though, because you knew you, especially if you take some time off and you're coming back and even at a third, but it was at a smaller convention. So it didn't feel. Yeah. It didn't feel smaller. No. Cause we, we did move back to the LEX Hilton where scale had been, for many years before we had mm -hmm. moved to the the Pasadena Convention Center. And it is a much smaller venue, but it didn't feel smaller because all the halls were busy and and uh, all the uh, talks were busy. So, oh, and uh, one of the highlights was uh, seeing Vince Cerf, uh, one of the fathers of the, of the internet, actually one of the inventors of TCP IP. And he was the final keynote on Sunday and he was amazing. <laughs> So, so what you're saying is you might go back to the next one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I am uh, working two boos now. <laughs> it's pretty strong, maybe. Yeah, pretty strong, maybe. <laughs> so, absolutely. <laughs> I've been playing around with a bunch of things. If you tuned in Saturday and you didn't get a chance uh, to watch the show, then what were you doing tuning in? Uh, we were mm -hmm. visited by Dennis Payne. Yeah. He came and hung out with us for about 30 minutes to tell us about his... Uh, Come on, let me get Dennis. There's dead ass. He's got a project where he's doing a Kickstarter to kind of revive and bring up to date older games and starting with Mojotron, which is a game that, you know, and moving away from like, here's a word you might not have heard in a long time, mm -hmm. clan lib and porting mm -hmm. that over to SDL and getting things. And also for windows too, he's going to make windows binders and stuff like that. But he did tell us about what it's like being an open source game developer. And he has worked on commercial projects. So if you get a chance, go back and listen to that. But uh, I got two things. One, I bought this guy. Ah, uh, yeah. Nice, Ben. You've been wanting that for a while. <laughs> I've been dreading buying it for yeah. <laughs> a little bit, but curiosity got the better of me because you'll see there's a CPU in there. That is the Ryzen 1700, the original, the, the vintage, as Joe might mm -hmm. say. Yes. First gen Ryzen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, early adopter big fan of amd despite what some people might think and um what made this interesting was msi released a beta bios that lets you put the ryzen 5 series the new one you know the 20 what is this again i keep forgetting 5600 g yeah into a b350 first gen ryzen motherboard so i flashed uh yeah, let's talk about long life right <laughs> going from from the original Ryzen, yeah, up until to the brand new stuff, which I know there's going to be brand newer stuff out. But I was just kind of curious, you know. I was going to buy the CPU and the motherboard, and I said to myself, "Vin, if you go ahead and buy that motherboard, you're never going to try this." Right. So I bought the CPU, and I sat around the house with the CPU for a few days, and I'm like, "Okay, I got to try this." And um, I wouldn't flash it. This is the reason I'm telling everyone this. Yes, it technically works. Everything does mm -hmm. work. But you lose your fancy UFI interface, you know, the one where you can set your fan curves. And basically, oh, UFI, yeah. It's kind of a oh. mixed bag. It's kind of a okay. mixed bag because, A, the, they call it like the MSI Click BIOS. You can actually navigate this cut trim down BIOS, which is in black and white to save space to get it to fit on there. You can navigate it with keyboard like you could the old BIOSes, like the American Megatrend BIOS. You remember those? You never, mm -hmm. they didn't have mouse support. Yep. It looked like an in-curses interface, which yeah. I think is like, give me more of that. But the downside is that being a beta BIOS, you can't set fan curves or anything like that. You have the uh, okay. option of like on or predefined fan curve, which is like, ah, oh, so I'm going to get the motherboard anyway. 
mainly because I don't have an option to overclock or underclock the CPU, mm. which is something I want to do. I want to underclock it and dial it back as much as possible. So I don't know if you want to play around with it. If you were curious and like, yes, you can, it's running right now. It's in Jackbox. It's doing everything it's supposed to do. I mean, it's pegged at 4.4 gigajoules just running and I threw one of these on the radiator. This is the most expensive fan I've ever bought. I still haven't gotten over it. I'll probably bring this up three or four more times in the upcoming months. Uh, this is that $30 Noctua fan, the one with all the blades on it. It works. I don't know if it works for $30 worth of fan, but it's no, on there. Um, it's <laughs> I don't hear it. I've been playing around with the Jackbox. I got, uh, I am trying to make things quieter in here because I want to uh, start using a ribbon mic. I got my test ribbon mic out right now, but I got to like lower the noise floor that you can't really get away. Ribbon mics are technically dynamic mics. Like, you know, a condenser mic is going to pick up anything. You know, you put 50 dB of gain into a condenser mic, you can go outside your room and talk and it'll pick it up. They're good room mics. Dynamic mics, like the one Jill has or my RE27ND, those work on a voice engine, you know, so it's actually sound pressure moving coils inside to do that. This is just, it, it's a ribbon, and I'm terrified of ribbons anyway because I can break them, mm. and I have broken them in the yeah. past. <laughs> um, so I'm really far air-gapped from this thing. Now, anyway, back to that original story. I, I said this in the, pre, the pre-show. I put an intake fan on uh, one of my spare Noctua fans, my 140s, and it was great. I was going to cut it up, make it nice and air flowy. Come to find out, like the cut-ins for 120 millimeter fans that were kind of overlapping the fan when I put it on. Mm. Once I got up to about 1200 RPMs, created a whistling noise jump. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> the fan was perfectly silent, but you were hearing like that. Oh. Like, man, talk about defeated and can't do anything about it. I just left it in there. I dialed it back and said, we just going to call it a day. So that's all I, oh, the RM, the RME Pro video is up. It's in Discord right now. I'll post that on uh, Patreon for patrons uh, this afternoon when I go to post this show. So if you've been curious about one of the biggest and baddest audio interfaces that has actual Linux support, like good, not like we reverse engineered, RME provided the source code for the drivers to the developer like they've been doing for 22 years. And it is up and running doing the show right now. So if you're interested in that, go check it out. It is expensive. I kind of go over that. I'm going to try to sell you on. It's a value. It's a bargain. But it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. Joe, let's get into it. I had an adventure with OBS OBS Studio. OBS adventure. (laughs) Man, I I like OBS. We use OBS for the show. I'm a pretty big champion of it, but I'm also a detractor of it because I do not have it in me to blindly champion something. I think if you love something... It is your responsibility to point out the flaws as well as the positives. And OBS 28, this is a big one. A bunch of things are changing. I know this is going to make some people sad. No more 32-bit support. That's gone. That's gone. You just got to let it go. Yeah. And um, But they've done some good things for Linux. They've switched from G- GLX to EGL rendering, which is going to be smoother experience, especially when you're dealing with you know newer window managers or Wayland, anything like that. Unfortunately for me, this means that it no longer remembers any of my sources, so I have to reset things like the Discord capture and the browser capture, unless I happen to have them open before I start OBS. That's kind of a weird one. A couple of bonus things for Linux. H.264 format is now supported in V4L2 for webcams, Mm -hmm. which is Nice. nice. That is there. Another thing that's going to break all kind of things, which is why I want people to get out and test it, is they've moved from Qt5 to Qt6. That I've already ran into one of our primary plugins. The live closed mm-hmm. captioning system does not work with that at all, not even a little bit. But oh boy, <laughs> instead of getting angry and um, writing nasty things in the OBS Discord or anything crazy like that, what it did is I went to the plugin developer, opened this request. I'm like, hey, OBS 28 is out, they're moving to QT6. This doesn't work. And if you go right now, you can download the new version which is available for testing, which has been worked for QT6. So that I'm looking forward to. Another thing, though, WebSockets. You might not even know what a WebSocket is, and you know, 
you're probably living a better life than me. I do know what <laughs> WebSockets are. WebSockets allows you to control OBS remotely over TCP IP or locally, however you want to do it. You could control it over the internet. I could effectively give Jill a stream deck, not a steam deck with my <laughs> buttons on it and mirror it. And she could switch the show from LA if she wanted to over the That's internet. So awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't use the internet for it, but I use my intranet with a raspberry Pi. Well, they moved WebSockets to version 5.0 and they built it into OBS so you don't have to get the plugin anymore, but it's also version 5, which is not backwards compatible. Oh, okay. So I it see. doesn't work with my BitFocus Companion and all the uh, server I have set up with that. So I went to the OBS guy who did the OBS module for BitFocus Companion and I said, hey man, and there's currently a beta version out for testing. So if you want to try that. Outside of that, um, yeah, you can build it on Debian 11 which I know, I know it's an ancient, decrepit operating system that still works with EAC. Um, if you got to play with that earlier this week. Did you hear about that, Joe? Mm -hmm. Yes. And GLibC yeah. update G -Lib. like, broke EAC <laughs> compatibility Yeah. Uh, to my brothers and sisters running <laughs> Arch. Ouch. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can build it on Debian 11. Just enable the Debian backports where you can get hold of QT6 and everything builds. So, yeah. You got any thoughts on it? I mean, you like uh, the U yeah. the UI. Every time we talk about the UI, oh, I, yes. love, I love everybody who works on the OBS project. But every time I see that somebody like suggests something like, we're very concerned about, I was like, this is, this is developer UI, isn't it, Jill? Yeah. Well, I think it's nice that they added the ability to reset the whole user interface using the view menu a reset UI option. This is awesome because there's many times where I've done like major customizations on, in OBS and I want to reset them, but then you mm -hmm. have to go back and manually reset all your windows and everything. And this just allows you to reset back to default. <laughs> it's so much nicer. So I was really happy they included that option. And they also added support for custom FFmpeg options in media sources which is really wonderful. So you have the power of FFmpeg uh, directly in OBS, which was always there, but now it, it more easy access. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, there, there's a gang of like little features and, and things like that. You do have uh, uh, even an option if you want to play around with it. I think the HEVC is built into 28 by default now too. Mm, nice. But again, uh, go test it. I don't know... Uh, you know, if you're somebody, building OBS is really simple. It's really simple. It's even a type of project that I would recommend if you said, Vin, I don't want to compile anything. And I understand. I posted a thing in our Discord last night of somebody compiling. Um, it was the overgrowth developers, you know, the hippity, mm. hippity hop rabbit game yeah. that they open sourced. <laughs> um, yeah. They're like, yeah, this is how you build overgrowth from source. And they showed it on Windows. And I'm like, no, no, that 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 is jarring to see how it you have to comp just doing it on windows and uh, compiling and anything on windows is a hard headache getting it together and getting the git repo and a, a gui for cmake and do i'm like well that takes 20 minutes that is three lines man on the console <laughs> um, so that was kind of tragic so i could understand if that is what you're thinking about especially if you're moving over to linux like i don't want to go through that it's not that bad anywhere near yeah. that bad it is kind of fun and kind of good. Speaking <laughs> of kernels, though, 5.19 yeah. is out, and I just upgraded to 5.18 because uh, we got a 5.18 kernel support for the drivers for this RME thingy. Yay! Oh, that's good, Ben. So, yeah, Linux kernel 5.19 has been released, and actually the biggest additions and changes to the Linux kernel this time focuses on networking, both wired and wireless, and much more CPU support. Also, something unique about this release is that Linus Torvalds managed the Linux kernel 5.19 release on an M2-powered Apple laptop, thanks to Asahi Linux. And that was really, really cool that Linus you know, made that move and did the, the development on an M2. I've... He's worked with Max in the past. Yes, he has. He absolutely has. So the, uh, some of the major updates include big TCP support was added, which allows bigger TSO GRO packet sizes for IPv6 traffic and achieves network speeds up to 400 
gigabit. And this will, you know, it, it, obviously this will give a significant boost for high performance networking and cloud-based data centers. So any system or service that sees massive networking traffic should greatly benefit from the addition of big C TCP. So that was actually major. And I know Linus had been working on that for quite a while. And there's support for the Realtek 8852CE chipset, as well as the MediaTek T700 modems and Renaissance RZ V2M. So, you know, very important um, hardware and chipsets that are being supported. And there's initial support for the Lung Arch CPUs based on MIPS architecture. And at, as we talked about in June with the release of the Linux kernel 5.19, release candidate one, the 5.19 Linux kernel comes with support for multiple ARM platforms. And this is very, very, very important. Torvald stated, it's something I've been, aw been awaiting for a long time. And it's finally reality thanks to the Asahi Linux team. We've had ARM64 hardware around running Linux for a long time, but none of it has really been usable as a development platform until now. So yeah, that that is awesome. <laughs> I think it's happy. I mean, doing the development on an M1, which is kind of neat because, hey, mm -hmm. I've already said, you know, personally, I want to play with the hardware. I just don't want to pay that Apple price. Yeah. You know, and it, it hits double hard when you're, because part of the Apple price is getting that Apple ecosystem, like step one, wipe that away. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm glad he's there. I'm glad he's doing that. And uh, I, I really wish uh, Asashi had like a different name, like Mapple. Yeah. <laughs> Mapple. That works in, in, uh, in many ways. <laughs> I'm I mean, I'm ripping off the Simpsons with that, of course, but yeah. it would it, it would still work. But yeah, five five nineteen's got a bunch. I hope five twenty is going to be an LTE like long term support. If mm -hmm. five, since five nineteen is not, I just want something that is not mainline that I can you know just slap on Jackbox and just let it ride it out. Yeah. So yeah, good times, mm -hmm. good times. And if you're still running something like five, well, yeah, five fifteen or before. Anything before 5.16, do yourself a favor, especially if you got audio, USB audio interfaces. It is a night and day dramatic difference in latency reduction. Like, we're talking, I had to go back and double check my benchmarks. From wow. Big, I thought something was wrong, but it was right, which is good, which is neat. Let's talk about Moonrays. M-O-O-N. That spells, don't ever go back and rewatch that TV series. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't hold up i wanted it to but dreamworks right <laughs> yeah and that, awesome moonray is dreamworks now open source award-winning state-of-the-art mcrt renderer and it's been used for a lot of stuff how to train your dragon trolls world tour the bad guys uh mm -hmm. posting boots last wish and plenty of future titles yeah they're just going to release it man um this is wonderful news DreamWorks really, has really. always been like a huge advocate for open source. I've, I've went Absolutely. back and like watched a couple of their talks from way yeah. back when, and they haven't done one recently, but they are currently preparing the packages for a public release. And they expect Mo Moonray to be available on GitHub soon, which I'm like, all right, this is going to be a GitHub. You can do it. And if you're wondering, my first thought was like, how do we use this with Blender? Uh, Hydra. Yeah, Hydra. Um, and actually, Hydra is a, a Pixar's engine. So um, of, of bringing in uh, scene files from uh, the different platforms. And Hydra was also is it, Pixar had open sourced that years ago. And that was used to create the movies uh, 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 Finding Nemo and Finding Dory because they, they needed uh, uh, you. They needed. Uh, a special way to do their underwater scenes. Mm. So they used Hydra with that and made that open source. And I had heard Seagraph at at the Seagraph convention, P 
Pixar had done a talk years ago about open sourcing Hydra, and, the, and they did. So now the whole community is benefiting, including DreamWorks. And DreamWorks themselves have created lots of open source plugins and codecs over the years. I've, I've known some of the uh, developers that work for DreamWorks, and it's, it's amazing what they're doing with open source. They've it's really uh, awesome. Got a good this, track record with it. And it's a yeah. good thing to have, you know, especially, I mean, it's a good business decision for your company too, because now yeah. it's openly accessible. People don't have to, you're a teenager. What are you going to go for? You're going to go for the one that costs the low, low price of free when you're playing around with stuff like this. And for anybody on top of that, you get access to it. Like if yeah. you want to integrate it into something. Now, I couldn't find exactly what it's going to be released under. Hopefully, you know, some version of the GPL or maybe an MIT license, but. I heard Apache, but I'm. I'm Apache? Don't correct me on that, but I, I had heard a rumor of Apache. Okay. So. Um, it doesn't matter what it's under. Somebody will be upset about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 And it's going to be an open source license. I'm looking forward to trying out Moonray because honestly, for years, actually for when I was an independent um, computer animation contractor and for my students at, um, at the college I teach at, uh, I've been using Pixar's RenderMan. So it's nice and, and that's proprietary. So it's nice to have an open option out there. And right. uh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing but good things to say about that. Uh, yeah. We also have nothing but good things to say about the people who support the show. Patreon.com yeah. forward slash Linux Gamecast. If you like what we do, kick us four quarters a week. We throw in some bonus things to say thanks for that, like early access. I did a behind the scenes thing with, I think it's just called like Smooth Jazz with Old Man Vin for <laughs> um, making the latest interfacing Linux video. Where it's like, you know what? This is this is an eight minute video. Let me sit down with you for thirty minutes and walk you through everything and how it's stuck together. <laughs> so if you're down with stuff like that, it's my very very unofficial Learn DaVinci Resolve with Vin. So Yay. you might be able to take anything away from that. That is up for patrons. You're going to get her to look at the AIO Pro access to our Discord. We do an extra hour of content each and every week in podcast format. These shows, if you just need Linux flavored content and you need more of it live and uncut versions we try to keep these shows uh on wednesdays around 30 minutes but it's usually about an hour hour and a half for the whole thing you get a custom feed just for that and our eternal gratitude and thanks plus your name in the credits which is also a thing if you don't want your name in the credits how about buying a t-shirt we got shirts put them all over yeah. your face chest neck i don't know how you could put, well i guess you could put a t-shirt on your neck we'll call it a scarf yes i have all mugs. this swag <laughs> all this merch <laughs> <laughs> Tons of stuff. Anytime I need some extra money, I just uh, throw some new merch up in a couple of different colors and Jill buy it. And yeah. <laughs> it works out just, just fine. Speaking of things for Jill, if you like RGBs and penguins and you want to see it in Jill's room, taking up valuable force, of force. Yes. Space. It oh. takes it. My penguins take up over a third of my computer room. So <laughs> that's good. <laughs> You can do it. Head over to LinuxGameCast.com. Just mouse over the support button, which now works on mobile. You can tap it and go down. Uh, Jill's got a list. Pedro's got one. Jordan has one. Mm -hmm. I got one for the studio, which I don't. I don't have anything on here that I necessarily want. Yeah, um, stuff you need. <laughs> stuff I dread. That's what yeah. ends up there. But if you just want to uh, take a look at that and comment. Oh, and that's something I should point out. On our website, I keep forgetting to do this. If you go to our about thing, if you're curious about what's in the studio, every single thing that makes these shows possible, nice. itemize. You can look at them and you don't have to buy them on Amazon. You can just look it up and see what it is. And I mean, it's up to date. Look, there's that uh, crazy little resin processor mm -hmm. about HDMI switchers, power equipment, desk. There's the chair I'm sitting in. Yeah, that's a nice uh, 60s modern chair. Nobody likes this chair, Jill. <laughs> I do. I like the look of it. It might not Nobody be comfortable. Nobody likes sitting though. in it. I've I've mm. not had one person come in here and sit in this chair and go, oh no. Uh, -uh. first they yeah. get flipped out because there's no arms on it, but it also hub, like really hugs you. You basically yeah. If you have, have to keep wide, your knees together. If you have wide hips, it's kind of hard. <laughs> yeah, hard and, sit. It, and it's tight on me, and I'm anti-hip. I have no hips. Oh, uh, okay. I wouldn't fit in it then. <laughs> I hate yeah. huge hips. We do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your support plus i got it like a weird i'm gonna break it because i always end up because I, I like to 
end up sitting like this to have something to prop on with a gamepad if I'm in here playing on a live stream. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do thank you for your support. Anything for the studio, we'll put your uh, name back here on the Blinkatron board 9000 mm -hmm. as a way to de demonstrate to the rest of uh, the human population that you were fiscally irresponsible, and we thank you for it. Now, we need to talk about network pack. Mm hmm. Ooh. Oh, that's a good picture, Vin. <laughs> that's a, a Ethernet cable cable wrapped around a beautiful looking cake. <laughs> Block of sugar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a mini one, though. It's it's a Steve husband quality model. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it's a comically large ether noodle. Oh, that's true. That's true. But probably the other way around. <laughs> the reason we're bringing this up is because of this guy, a Raspberry Pi router board, which requires a CM4 module, but it's got two full speed gigabit network ports. It says it has Wi Fi, but we have our debates and it works with Open WRT. So, the, yeah, this is effectively a hat. I guess you call it a hat with a CM4. If I'm yeah. wrong, I'll leave a note in the comments. But yeah, it's got two gigabit Ethernet, and uh, we went looking in the um, pre-show for, like, where's where's the Wi-Fi? Yeah. Because there's the CM4. <laughs> you know, you plop that little guy in. I like how the CM4 goes in, like, the uh, Sun Ultra Spark Saber 2 series CPUs. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's got those, but fortunately, I don't have to, like, I probably still have a <laughs> screwdriver I used to carry around with me when I had to do those. It's just covered in that, like three rolls of electrical tape so oh. you can shove under it and jack that thing out yeah. but what do we have uh, hdmi usb c why would you need each i guess maybe that's the wii phase joe yeah yeah because we yeah me and ven were looking for that and um, look, it's shielded so maybe because we went down in the documentation mm -hmm. and it says you know it's got usb 2.0 interface that can be used as a flash driver US, usb keyboard printers wi-fi modules so maybe you can have second Wi-Fi. I don't know, but it's yeah. fifty-four ninety, and it's currently in stock. There's ten plus in stock, but you got to find a CM4. Mm -hmm. Hundred and eight dollars <laughs> for it? Get wrecked. Oh boy! Oh boy! Not gonna. Ha Is it even in stock? Probably uh... not. Uh, but on back order. Um, I don't like the. We, we've not. Nature is not fully healed. Yeah. That's all I can say about that. And uh, I I like the idea of this, but I don't think anybody's expecting too much. What I was curious about, OpenWRT, can it actually route at hmm. a gigabit or anywhere near a gigabit with, you know, a couple of IP rules set on it? Because I can bring my router board 4011 which is just got like a big honking quad core arm chip in it with a gig of ram almost to its knees with enough ip filters on it and just routing rules uh you know i can get it down to like it max ability like maybe 200 300 megabits yeah so okay. yeah uh but i 50 think bucks? it should it, it you know it should because there there have been other manufacturers that make uh make uh you know open source routers that um can handle the load uh, well, this is where i get curious because mm -hmm. like, i'll go back to the 4011 the 4011 is a built for wireless isps it's never intended as a home router like it's it's built to take big chunky loads so this you know if you could get you probably like a reasonable setup could probably do like i don't know maybe half yeah. gig if you're lucky I don't yeah. know. I want to play with it. I see uh, Mr. Alert points out that some of the CM4 modules have built-in Wi-Fi. Do have Wi-Fi. Wi yeah. Yeah, that's hmm. true. I was, thank you, Alan, for putting that in because I was I was thinking about that as we were talking about this. I, I thought there was one that had a Wi-Fi support. But um, my my concern was that where do you put an antennas? <laughs> Wi-Fi antennas. <laughs> so... Oh, come on. The kids but, don't use antennas these days, Joe. Yeah. I mean, you could get USB, external USB ones. And yeah, so that you can transmit your Wi-Fi signal further. Now, that being said, the Raspberry Pi boards have gotten really, really good at Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi chip in there is uh, uh, generally very strong. And the last few iterations of the Raspberry Pi, they transmit very well. 
So, and, but this will be a really nice, honestly, a nice option when they start ramping up production of the CM4s and you could get them at a lot cheaper prices. This will be a cost effective way of making, you know, say two to four routers for the cost of a one good name brand one. Or on something the for the, like just around the house, like the CM4s got to get back yeah. down to the, like 30 to $50 price point before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. They're unobtainium <laughs> currently. And I, I could say something like this is uh, is more of a play around device. I wouldn't put, you know, 20 users on this. Yeah. Yeah. But home, like home device. small or like, you know, a bridge, you could mm-hmm. set it up to do something like that or a NAS. And um, perfect for a NAS. Yeah. It's there. Slow power. So, but, you know, don't do yourself any favors. Don't go ahead and order it until you can get a CM4. There's nothing, nothing worse than having half of a thing. Yeah. Where you're just sitting around going, um, I can't do anything with this yet. Ah, (laughs) oh man. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of unfamiliar with the Wi-Fi capabilities of Raspberry 4 because it's usually Wi-Fi kills almost like it's in the top five things I do when I start one up. Yeah just in a habit i did test it out on that um raspberry pi zero two or okay the, the latest w no no yeah the w the latest w uh just out of curiosity i mean it does work so there is that all right yeah. um yeah somebody go buy one and make pretend you can make a little uh cardboard compute module and put on top of it and cosplay as a router It'll be a yeah yeah <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, we've run actually a little long, but thanks for hanging out with us. And uh, we got, we got lots of uh, patrons to thank. All right, fine. <laughs> we'll do that yeah. instead. Oh, <laughs> did I make Ben lose track? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Is Jill still saying something? I had her muted. <laughs> Uh, our advisors, Omegas and Artharon, thank you. <laughs> Executive producers, Barbrandt, Scott M, Atomic, Mike G, Empty, Chicago, patrons, Abstraction, <laughs> Sea Monsters. Got plenty of Sea Monsters. David Darkweed, System T, Nubbin. Truggles. <laughs> hey, look, there's Cheesy Bacon. Yeah, Cheesy Bacon's in Go there. Jack. Good luck. And, and Dot Geek is in there, and Sacred Egg uh, Monica's and in there. I forgot to put them in. New patrons. Oh yeah, we have new patrons. Oh yeah, Ben, we have new patrons. <laughs> Next week, I guess we'll have to make sure to thank them.